uh, Tapio Schneider to the Distinguished Seminar Series in Computational Science and Engineering. Uh, Tapio is a friend in the sense of uh, MIT. He's been involved in research with many of us over the years. Uh, I would contend that Tapio is one of the intellectual leaders in the field of climate dynamics. He has received many awards over the years. He's been named one of the 20 best brains under 40 by Discover Magazine. He received uh, both a Packard and a Sloan Research Fellowship. He was awarded the James Holton Award from the American Geophysical Union and the Rosenstein Award from the University of Miami. But what I respect the most about Tapio's approach to science is that he's probably one of very few examples that this in climate dynamics I know of, or somebody who is really after a fundamental question. He doesn't live in a niche of his expertise. He's always tried to look at what were the fundamental questions in climate dynamics and pursue them. He started his career mostly trying to see how computation and numerical model could be used to test what were at the time established and agreed upon basic theoretical ideas about the working of the overall climate system properties like heat transport by turbulence in the atmosphere and shows that when these theories were put to test with numerical models now they can explore parameter space more effectively they didn't seem to be as accurate or as well established as we thought after that he realized that the next big question or one of the fundamental question beyond just understanding large scale dynamics was coming from aspects at smaller scale that affect the climate system like clouds that's a very substantial shift in expertise but he took the challenge on and start enjoying a new community essentially and trying to make fundamental progress in seeing how we can bring a computation and observation to bear uh, to answer the role of system like clouds on different scales on the climate system and today he's going to talk about how he keeps moving along this line and he's trying to push in rethinking about how we do modeling of the climate system in ways that would hopefully allow us to both understand the system better and make more accurate and actionable predictions so I leave now the floor to Tapio, and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Raf. I'll try to live up to that introduction. <clears throat> yeah, I will talk about climate modeling, and to say it from the outset, I, I listed a bunch of people here who have directly contributed to some of the results I will be showing. But th this is about a large project of which Raf and Alan Edelman and many others at MIT are part, and I'll talk about it. Um, so. Why do we need better climate models and what do we need them for? Um, <clears throat> I think everyone knows Earth has been warming. And this is the warming relative to pre-industrial times through the mid 2010s or so. This is just a low pass filtered version of it. You see the warming is truly global. It's just very few exceptions, perhaps here over South America, but that might as well be a data problem. And by now has, the world has warmed there as well. There are these gray patches where we don't have enough data to say much about global warming or about warming um, over 150 years. But by and large, the warming is global. It's stronger over land than over oceans for reasons we understand, thanks in good part to the work of Paul Gorman at MIT. Um, it's stronger in high latitudes than in lower latitudes for reasons we partially understand. And it's, it's very much what we see here is what we would expect from increased concentration of greenhouse gases. It's clear Earth is continuing to warm as greenhouse gas concentrations increase. And actually quite rapidly, we've had about 0.4 degrees of warming over the last 20 years alone. We've had a little over one degree centigrade or Kelvin warming globally um, since the beginning of the industrial revolution. So, so far that's all clear and established and well known, but we'd like to say a bit more precisely of where we are going. And you can ask the question of where we are going in many different ways. One simple one is you can ask, how much CO2 can you put in the atmosphere before we have reached some arbitrary threshold of global warming? So pick the two degrees global warming of the Paris Agreement relative to pre-industrial times. We had about a degree and you have about another degree to go. We had to more than a degree and to less than a degree to go. And you can ask the 29 climate models of the previous version of the IPCC report, the most recent published version of the IPCC report. How much CO2 can you put in the atmosphere before this two degree threshold is breached? And the answer varies between somewhere around 480 parts per million and close to 600 parts per million. So we are at about 415 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere, 480 parts per million would be reached 
<clears throat> sometime in the next 20 years or so, maybe a little bit more than 20 years. So if the models on the right here are correct, then the we basically cannot avoid um, reaching a two degrees warming above the pre-industrial levels. If the models on the left here are correct, then, well, we would have a lot more time before the two degree warming threshold is, is reached. So this would be, even under high emission scenarios, we wouldn't reach close to 600 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere before the 20, 2060s or so. So it's a full human generation difference in what one would think is one crucial prediction that we as climate scientists should provide to, to the world. And that's evidently somewhat unsatisfying. It, it's, it's hard to act based on uncertainties that are this large. And not only are the uncertainties large, they're also poorly quantified. So this is just an ensemble of models. It, it's, it's not to be understood as a true quantification of uncertainties. As has become clear in the last year or two with new models coming online that have even higher climate sensitivities that warm even more rapidly even outside the range of these 29 models that are shown here. There are many reasons why climate predictions are uncertain. Ocean turbulence plays a role. Um, details of microphysical processes in clouds, but there's really one big factor that dominates the uncertainties. And that is the question of how low clouds over tropical oceans respond to climate change. By low clouds, I mean, for example, stratocumulus clouds off the coast of Baja California, California, so I'm sitting somewhere up here right now, or cumulus clouds here around the Hawaiian Islands. They're extremely important for climate because they reflect a lot of sunlight. Um, they're just a white blanket over the ocean for the stratocumulus clouds reflecting sunlight. So under these stratocumulus clouds, it's cooler than it would be if dark ocean surface is exposed that absorbs a lot more sunlight. So if you get more low clouds, reflect more sunlight as the climate warms, the warming will be damped. If you get fewer low clouds, you get stronger warming because less sunlight is being reflected. And climate models don't even agree on the sign of the response, although more tend to produce fewer low clouds as the climate warms, so amplified warming. But the magnitude is all over the place of this cloud feedback in current climate models. So if you go back to this plot, the models, each bar was a model, 29 of them. They're ordered in order of increasing climate sensitivity. So it's a measure of how how much warming you get in response to increasing CO2 concentrations in equilibrium. So the most sensitive models are on the right, least sensitive are on the left. And the most sensitive models tend to produce fewer low clouds as the climate warms, amplifying the warming. The less sensitive models tend to produce more low clouds or not much of a change in low clouds as the climate warms and that can either damp the warming or leave it, leave it unmodified. So fundamentally, we don't know which, if any of these is right. Um, it, it's clear enough that climate is warming that we should do something about it. Um, it's from an economic point of view relatively clear that it makes sense to mitigate some of the warming at least. Um, but I think the big socioeconomic factor that is upon all of us now is that the climate is changing rapidly <clears throat> and so rapidly that we'll just have to adapt. We can't avoid some climate change. And climate adaptation requires better information. So we want to make data-driven decisions about how high a seawall to build in around Boston Harbor one day or New York City to protect itself against storm surges. And you like to know quantitatively how high the seawall needs to be to protect yourself against a 100-year flood in 30 years or so. In the developing world, um, development patterns will, will have to depend on how the climate is changing. Water management infrastructure everywhere um, is very much dependent on climate change, how big a storm drain you build and the like um, will depend on how much climate change we get and you need to ensure food and water security and the like. The various estimates around of what climate change adaptation will cost, uh, the uh, United Nations Environmental Protection Agency estimated that the costs will reach hundreds of billions of dollars annually by 2050. And the flip side to that is if you know what to adapt to, there is a large savings potential. And people have tried to estimate it, how large that potential is. So if you improve the accuracy of climate predictions, if you just reduce errors by a factor of two in the next 10 years, um, <clears throat> the socioeconomic value of that was estimated to lie in the trillions of dollars. The US has one example, the US um, 
Government Accountability Office stated that the climate information needs of federal, state, local, and private sector decision makers are not being fully met. So in other words, while we know climate is changing, we know in, in some ways enough that mitigation is necessary, we don't know, in, you don't know enough to adapt proactively and efficiently. So climate predictions are uncertain, and I said clouds are one primary culprit, and I want to use the clouds, talk in some detail about what we do about it, but really use them as an example for other problems in the climate system that you can approach similarly to how we approach the clouds. But first, why are clouds hard? Various ways of looking at it. Um, I think one helpful way is to think about how much water there's in the atmosphere. So if you take all water in the atmosphere and bring it as a liquid layer to the surface, you get a liquid layer that's about an inch thick, 25 millimeters thick. And that's all water, whether it's vapor or condensed water. However, you might as well say that's just only the vapor because the condensed water, so droplets and ice crystals and clouds, they're only a tiny fraction of the total amount of water in the atmosphere. So the total amount of water that's in clouds, if you bring that to the surface and express the amount as an equivalent liquid layer, in the global mean, you get about a layer 100 microns thick, so about the thickness of a human hair or a coat of paint. And if you say take a typical low cloud, like these stratocumulus clouds that we often have off the coast here, um, those likewise have about 100 microns of water in them. So the total amount of water in the clouds as expressed as the thickness of a liquid layer is just about 100 micron. So when you try to predict clouds, you're trying to predict what fraction of a trace constituent of the atmosphere, water vapor in itself is this trace constituent, and you're you are asking what tiny fraction of that trace constituent is condensing as air ascends and turbulent updrafts. And without knowing much about climate models, I think you can appreciate this is difficult. You know, the climate model has resolutions of maybe tens or 100 kilometers on the side. And with that, you're trying to predict a liquid layer 100 microns or so, so thin. And that's without going into computing details, I think easy to understand. It's a difficult job. And climate models are not doing well at it. Um, Another way of looking at it is think about scales and clouds. So a global climate model has any horizontal resolution of typically 100 kilometers right now, going towards tens of kilometers. We've had a few simulations for limited times, not on climate time scales, on the kilometer scale resolution. However, even those highest resolution simulations we had are far, far away from being able to resolve these low clouds over tropical oceans. Their dynamical scales are in, in the meters to tens of meters. So there's an enormous scale gap to be bridged um, before we can simulate those clouds globally. Before I got involved in, in, in this type of work, I want to make sure that I don't become redundant too fast. So I try to estimate how long it would take before we have a big enough computer that can simulate low clouds globally. And the answer is it will not be feasible for decades. You need, you need a computer about 10 to the 12 times faster than the fastest we have in order to, to simulate clouds globally. So pure brute force computing is not going to get us out of this. In climate models, clouds are typically represented in a fairly ad hoc fashion in various semi-empirical ways. You just need to represent these small scale dynamics of scales of tens of meters in, in, on a mesh with a resolution of tens of kilometers. And various empiric empiricisms are used that tend not to be strongly data informed. And it's not working too well. Here is one example of a recent climate model. This is a French model, and I'm only showing it because the, the, they put together a nice graph showing the biases in clouds. It's most climate models look more or less the same. What is showing here is what's shown here is the low cloud bias relative to observations. So it's the cloud cover in the model minus that observed. And what you're seeing is that especially over eastern tropical ocean basins say off the coast of Baja California, California or Peru, Chile or Namibia, Angola, you have enormous biases. The color scale is saturated at 40-50%. So the, the model is predicting something like a factor two or even more too few low clouds relative, relative to what is observed. This is fairly typical for climate models. They all underestimate the prevalence of um, low clouds, especially in these tropical ocean regions. This leads to enormous biases in the energy balance because these clouds are so important for reflecting sunlight. If you have too few of them, you're absorbing more sunlight than you should, leading to various other problems. And for example, the precipitation distribution in these models. 
So this is a well-known problem, a long-standing problem. Um, it is so well known, it has a name, it's called the too few too bright bias. And the too bright part refers to the fact that the clouds that are out there are made brighter than they should be, in part perhaps to compensate for the fact that there are too few of them. So improving predictions is urgent. And the question is, how can we, how can we make progress? Um, I think there are two, two sources of information that are underused in climate modeling. One is the enormous amount of observational data we have. This is one example. You're shown the A-train of satellites observing Earth. We have about a terabyte of satellite data per day that we receive from orbit about Earth climate. These data are used for evaluating climate models. You just and just in a graph I showed you before, you use space-based observations and hold the model next to it and see how well or not well the model does. But they're not used in any systematic way to inform climate models directly. This is just space-based data. In the same token, we have a lot of floats in the ocean and the like. We're, we're truly living in the golden age of data about Earth. And those data can be used much more extensively than they have been in the climate modeling enterprise. And the other capability we have are simulations. So while, for example, clouds, we cannot simulate globally, it's computationally not feasible, we can simulate them well in limited domains. So we know the equations governing them, Newton's laws of motion, the laws of thermodynamics, and we can you know, solve the corresponding partial differential equations on the fine enough mesh here with meter scale resolution, and you get animations that look like this. So this is a tropical cumulus cloud, where blue is indicating precipitation. And we can verify these simulations well against field data. They're, they're good simulations. We have high confidence in them. Even in these simulations, the processes collectively referred to as microphysics, so how droplets, ice crystals forms, they're still too small scales. They happen on micrometer scales to be directly resolvable. So these are still represented in um, semi-empirical ways. But at least all the turbulent dynamics we can resolve. So what you can do is use these limited area simulations to inform a climate model. So you can, for example, embed them in the global model. And that's what we have started doing. So you just take a limited area, very high resolution simulation and put them, for example, in the grid box of a climate model. So the interesting situation we are in is that the outer scale of a grid box, tens of kilometers has converged to the to the inner scale here, to the or the outer scale of the high resolution simulations, which likewise can be done in, in domains about tens of kilometers wide. So you can embed one such simulation in a climate model, or you can embed 10,000 of those in a climate model, however many you can run um, on the computers we have. What this gives you is an additional data source, um, simulated data that gives you detailed dynamical information where observations alone are not sufficient. Observations are great at giving you global coverage. They tend not to give you much temporal resolution and they don't tend to give you details such as vertical velocity distributions and clouds that you can get from high resolution simulations. And so here's another data source that you can use to inform a global climate model. Um, so what we are doing and we I'll say more about how we is, but Ralph and Ellen Edelman at MIT, for example, a part of it, as, as are many others at MIT, um, is building a climate model that a, learns directly from observations, be it from space or from the ground or from ocean observing instruments. And it learns directly from high resolution simulations that you can spin out in various parts of the globe. Um, you can optimize where and when you spin them out using experimental design ideas. and once we have a system like that, you could even use it to quantitatively ask questions, say, about what is the next observing platform we need to further reduce um, uncertainties in climate predictions at a given cost, for example. So the observing system design would, in principle, be also possible with a system like that, although we are quite far from being able to do this right now. So let me say a bit more about the approach here. I think this is important because there is obviously a lot of excitement about machine learning uh, for good reasons in the sciences now, but I think it's important to be aware of the limitations of deep learning, for example, and what they mean for especially climate modeling, but more generally for 
any kind of scientific modeling where we have a lot of data, but you can call it big data. But by and large, it's still not enough data to completely determine the models we like to be using. So the success of deep learning by and large rests on over parameterization. Um, you have very data hungry methods and that allow you to estimate a huge number of parameters, weights and neural networks and the like. And it gives you fantastic interpolation properties. However, it does lead to challenges with generalizability. So as soon as you try to predict something out of sample, this gets difficult. Um, it is challenging to interpret, although tools are advancing to, to help interpretability. And it's challenging to quantify uncertainties in the heavily over parameterized system. And in climate, what we absolutely need is generalizable generalizability. We want to predict something we haven't seen. And we do need uncertainty quantification. And well, we're all scientists. We like things to be interpretable. But perhaps if we could get the other two without interpretability, that's maybe something one could settle on. But for us scientists, it's nice if you have a model we can interpret. Reductionist science, as we have practiced for since Bacon's time, 400 years, rests on sparsity ultimately. Um, we, are, we prefer sparse models. We prefer Newton's um, mechanics and celestial mechanics over Ptolemy's, not because it fits the data better, it actually didn't at Newton's time, but because it's, it's sparser. It's fewer parameters you're fitting and Ptolemy's epicycles were overfitting the celestial, celestial um, dynamics and were hard to generalize. So the success of reductionist science rests on sparsity, which gives you generalizability and gives you interpretable models. And what we are doing in our approach to climate modeling is combine both um, traditional reductionist science with data science where reductionism hits its limits. And I want to show in some detail how we are doing this with clouds. But again, I, I mean it more as a case study of how you could approach other fields of science that share similar characteristics, which are many. So the basic ideas emerged over some months, maybe a few years, with a few colleagues, um, Raf Ferrari among them, and uh, Andrew Stewart here at MIT, at Caltech, sorry. And um, out of that was born what came to be known as CLIMA, the Climate Modeling Alliance, which now is about 60 scientists, engineers, applied mathematicians at four institutions. So at, in addition to Caltech, there is a group at MIT um, working on ocean modeling especially, and Ellen Edelman's Julia lab is working on computational aspects. There's a group at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which Caltech manages for NASA, working on land modeling, and the group at the Naval Postgraduate School working on um, applied math, numerical methods for atmosphere and ocean models. So this started two years ago, almost exactly two years ago. And um, what we are doing is building an Earth system model, a climate model, that at its core has in some ways traditional components, reductionist components. So it has an atmosphere model, an ocean model that all look recognizably like atmosphere and ocean models have for decades. Um, we are building all of these pieces from scratch. So there are many new elements to it, but it, it's still physical models for the physical systems or biological models for land mass, biosphere and the like. And wrapped around all of that is a layer of data simulation and machine learning tools through which all these model components right now individually learn, for example, from high resolution simulations of clouds that you can spin out or from observational data. And eventually, and eventually, uh, this will start within a year or so, when we put the pieces together, all these components will learn jointly from these data sources so that you can jointly quantify their uncertainties, for example. So how does this actually work? Um, I don't know what the right name for this is. It, it, it's not AI how most people understand it and that it's not strictly deep learning, but someone called it soft AI and maybe this is not a bad name. Um, we're using soft AI methods and here's how it goes. Um, if you look at current climate models, they have many parameters usually from ad hoc layering of different types of parameterizations on top of each other to get empirically better fit to observations. What we want is good fit to observations and we need um, good predictive capabilities. We need to be able to predict the climate we haven't seen. 
So for us, that meant we use the known equations of motion as far as we can, A, to promote sparsity, so minimize the number of adjustable parameters and avoid overfitting. And also, you know, there's a good reason we have done science like this for a few hundred years. There's a lot of embedded, embedded knowledge in it. You want to use it as far as you can. Now, climate data do not have high temporal resolution typically. Uh, for example, space-based data, polar orbiting satellites go over the same spot on Earth every 10 to 14 days or so. But what they do well is provide global statistics of various climate variables you might, interest, might be interested in. So you can get time aggregate statistics. And our approach here was to say, well, we want to predict climate and climate is statistics of weather. And if you want to predict climate statistics, well, you should learn from climate statistics from the outset. So we are learning from aggregated climate data in contrast to how it goes in weather prediction where you, where you are simulating weather states. Um, that has advantages and disadvantages, which I'll talk about in a moment. The first obvious disadvantage is that if you want to learn from climate statistics, you need to generate climate statistics computationally, so at least say, seasonal um, statistics. So every try of a climate model, you need to generate climate statistics over at least seasons, and that becomes computationally extremely expensive. So you need fast algorithms for learning about the models from data. Um, standard method like Markov chain Monte Carlo would not be feasible here. So let me just show you an example um, from cloud modeling. And again, the details are not the crucial part. It's more the approach, I think, that, that is, is generalized and might be of interest to others in other fields that, you, that you're working on. So this is work that uh, a number of people have worked on for the last few years, Yair Cohen, Jahe, Ana Yaruga, Ignacio Lopez Gomez, and it goes back to the PhD thesis by Shi Hong Tang um, a few years before that. Um, Typically in climate models, if you want to represent clouds and turbulence, you have disparate parameterization schemes doing the job and they're sort of layered on top of each other. Every climate model has a boundary layer turbulence scheme. Every climate model has some form of shallow convection scheme where shallow convection means these are clouds that don't rain. Um, and then there are deep convection schemes, which is for clouds that do rain. And then there are various schemes in between, typically microphysics for different types and the like. And these schemes are connected discontinuously in parameter space. So there are various parametric and structural discontinuities that only are there because of history, not because nature actually is discontinuous. It leads to a proliferation of free parameters. And the first thing we wanted to do is reduce the number of free parameters we have here and eliminate especially correlated parameters, which are hard to identify from data. And what we did is Details of equations are not crucial, just to say here are Navier-Stokes equations, essentially. We systematically coarse grain them, we use coarse graining methods that are familiar to most of you who apply math, physics. And we are coarse graining over subdomains that contain more isotropic turbulence or more coherent structures. And whenever you coarse grain, you lose information, you end up with closure terms, and these closure terms are in the boxes on the right hand side here. They represent interactions among subdomains through what we call entrainment and detrainment, mass fluxes between, say, the cloud and its environment. There are turbulent transport terms you need to close, and um, additionally, a number of other terms involving pressure gradients and the like. The details. I think are interesting for people in the atmospheric sciences, probably not interesting to most people here today. But I think, again, the approach is, is interesting because I think it generalizes. So you take whatever equations of motion you have, you coarse grain them, you end up with closure terms. These closure terms, we know something about. We don't know precisely what they are, but we do know more than nothing. What we do know are is what they depend on or what they might depend on. So we can do usual Buckingham pie analysis, looking at what types of non-dimensional groups could enter in these closure terms. And as you go through that exercise, you can write down candidate functions. You maybe know limits of these functions, even though not the precise functions, you know what they can depend on. And in our particular case, we did that. We came up with um, a set of functions for these various closure terms. 
that all look somewhat like that. For example, for entrainment, detrainment, there's a length scale entering here and the length scale can depend on various physical quantities. One is a buoyancy divided by vertical velocity squared. And then this is multiplied by a non-dimensional function of all the non-dimensional groups you have. And that function can be complicated. And our approach here is, as well, we go up to this point. Here is where we can't go much further with reductionism. We can say something about limits of these functions, but the functions ultimately you can learn from data. Um, so here is where, where data science starts and reductionist science ends. And you can do the same for all the various closure terms that appear. And just writing down simple candidate functions, um, we have since estimated some of them from, from data, but here is just actually just our first guess prior if you wish. And it worked so beautifully, it's all worth showing that all in itself. So on the left is the same map of biases in the climate model I showed before, for example, a stratocumulus region here or in polar regions of Greenland here. So polar boundary layers is something that climate models don't do well. They are often in winter, very stable, um, with very intermittent turbulence. It's notoriously hard to model. It's notoriously hard to simulate even in high resolution simulations. So here is two velocity components in the solid line and the high resolution simulation with um, millions of degrees of freedom. And the shading is of the range of results high resolution simulations give you. And then the dash dotted lines and the like are just the result of this reduced order model that I showed you before. It's a one dimensional model in the end. It has um, about 100 degrees of freedom rather than millions for the solid line. And the point is just as a resolution of this reduced order model becomes large enough, we can fit the high resolution simulations almost exactly. Same in these regions here where, where models typically have large biases simulating stratocumulus clouds. Almost all models do poorly at it. So here is a result of the same closure model now with the same parameters. There's nothing case specifically fitted. And an orange line observations, this is the liquid amount in the cloud. Gray is the shading of large eddy simulation results. And black is our large eddy simulation, which we think is particularly good. And blue is this reduced order model, the parentization. Um, again, we're going from millions of degrees of freedom in the black line to, in this case, I think 64 degrees of freedom in the blue line, and we end up with an almost perfect fit here. Um, you can go through various cases, and maybe let me not belabor the point too far. This here's a case for um, tropical cumulus clouds, shallow convection that can likewise reproduce, or deep convection over the Amazon, where the one crucial question is, what the diurnal cycle of deep convection is, when does deep convection set in? And here is a large eddy simulation showing updraft velocities. And here is the one dimensional model, again, a few degrees of freedom um, showing the same statistic. And the crucial point here is that the onset of precipitation in our simple model is pretty much at the same time as the onset or updrafts here, but same for precipitation, it's just not shown as in the high resolution simulation. So within one modeling context, we can capture all these different regimes. And the model is interesting for various reasons, aside from fitting well, which is of course necessary and good. It, it can be used in the gray zone, which is the resolution area where convection starts to be resolved. It is one scheme that captures a wide range of physics within one physical framework and it, in the form it is shown, it reduces the adjustable parameters relative to the many parameters that the climate models typically have. But beyond that, we also made it data adaptive. So as you have more data to calibrate such schemes with, you can increase the complexity of the scheme, increase the number of parameters. And it has a pretty interesting structure, actually. In some ways, it has a neural network structure um, in that there are these interconnects between domains. You can think of them as neurons to a degree um, that have um, sigmoidal functions switching with the, between them, the, the entrainment detrainment rates are sigmoidal functions. And it's, the structure of the scheme is a bit like a neural network where each node is, is a differential equation. That's not why we chose to do it that way, it just came out that way and it's an interesting analogy that however isn't in itself terribly useful in, in, in um, in using the scheme in practice. It's just to say that what you want in general is use physics to promote sparsity 
to restrict yourself to function spaces um, that that satisfy the necessary physical constraints, for example, and this scheme does it. And in some ways, what comes out is a network type structure um, that, however, however, is constrained so that energy is conserved and the like. So currently, we're implementing this in a climate model, and we have something like now on the order of 100 high resolution simulations with which we are calibrating the scheme and we are going towards thousands of these thousands of high resolution simulations that are driven by a climate model um oops so that's just so the, the reductionist aspect and now the data science aspect let me talk about that in in a bit more detail as well because that i think generalizes very well to many other fields so here's some joint work been doing with Andrew Stewart and Ollie Dunbar and Alfredo Gabuno, and there's an increasing number of others being entrained into this project as well. Um, I mentioned earlier that what we want to learn from are statistics of the climate system, not states of the atmosphere, for example, because statistics is what you want to predict. Um, you want to predict average rainfall or extremes in rainfalls, it's a higher order statistic, but you're not able to, or it's not, not even meaningful to ask what rainfall in Boston will be 20 years from now on you know, November 12th. So what this means is what we're doing is you can use any statistic that you wish, that you think is informative about the processes in a climate model. So at first order, these will be various mean fields um, that amounts to minimizing biases, minimizing mismatches between mean fields and also minimizing biases, say on top of atmosphere energy fluxes in a climate model. But you can do the same thing for any higher order um, climate statistics. For example, precipitation extremes is something we are very interested in for predictions. And you can um, minimize mismatches between simulated and observed precipitation extremes and learn from that mismatch to calibrate the model and quantify uncertainties. If you do that, if you use statistics to calibrate a model, the advantage is that you end up with smoother objective functions because statistics vary smoothly in space and time. There are states don't. So whether there's a cloud in Cambridge or in Boston, it's it's a, it's a um, discontinuously different situation from the perspective of the atmospheric state. But once you average cloud cover, it doesn't vary much between Cambridge and, and Boston, but varies quite smoothly over large scales. Um, it allows you to use climate relevant statistics, for example, covariances between cloud cover and temperature or something that people call emergent constraints directly in the objective function you can directly learn from that. The downside is that accumulation of averages is expensive. So every time you need to accumulate an average, you need to run a climate model for however long you want to accumulate the average, and that is expensive. So what we needed are ways of learning from data that are fast, uh, much faster than existing methods. And we had given ourselves a budget of, well, we can do about a thousand climate model runs to calibrate a model and um, quantify uncertainties. And that number came from what typically climate modeling centers do when they do, do calibrate models by hand. Let me maybe in the interest of time, skip some details of, well, maybe say it quickly. So I mean, mathematically, our problem is that we want to learn about a parameter vector from data Y, and we have a model G that maps from parameters to, <clears throat> to data. Because we are using climate statistics, um, it's reasonable to make some central limit theorem assumptions that the 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 this that there is a noise term here that's reasonably Gaussian, and um, has some variance that we can estimate as well. We want to calibrate theta. We want to know what the optimal parameters are, but we also want to estimate uncertainties. G is generally very expensive to evaluate. This is our climate model. Um, it may only be approximate in that there will be systematic model errors and systematic model errors will be something else fun to talk about what we do about what we do with them. And I'm not going to talk about it in this talk. And generally we either do not have derivatives of G or they're hard to get. Um, often G is just not differentiable. And in an optimization setting, well, you formulate an objective function, say in an L2 norm here, uh, where what you do is you minimize the mismatch between y, this is your vector of climate statistics containing means, covariances, and the climate statistics output by the climate model G as a function of the parameters. You can usually do this with order hundreds of evaluations of G, even when the parameter space is very high and high, high dimensional. So with derivative-free methods such as um, ensemble common inversion as one example, 
that's the typical computational effort required. And it scales well to high dimensional data and parameter spaces. So the 100 is fairly, um, it's not strongly dependent on the size of the parameter space. But what we want is uncertainties. And so the usual way of doing it is take the Bayesian approach where what you want to get is the posterior density of theta. And the standard way of doing that is getting it by sampling, for example, with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. It usually requires on the order of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 evaluations of G. And that's just not doable for a climate model. So the approach we came up with, and <clears throat> This is maybe also one fun example of what happens when you have true collaborations between applied mathematicians, computational scientists, and people from the atmospheric climate sciences. Put the, be put the best of all these fields in some ways together. The, the approach we came up with, we called Calibrate Emulate Sample. And here's how it goes. You use gradient-free ensemble methods, such as ensemble common inversion, or something that an Andrews group developed called ensemble common sampler to um, calibrate the parameters. But this is not only the calibration, not only the optimization over theta that this is done, what is done here. More to the point, what this step does is solve the experimental design problem of placing good training points to train an emulator of this expensive climate model. So we use the iterations of the ensemble common inversion, ensemble common sampler. So you have an ensemble of size 100 and typically five or so iterations over which that converges. So you have something like 500 training points. We use these training points to train an emulator. Right now, I'll show you some examples from Gaussian processes. This could be neural networks you can use here very well. And then we sample the emulator with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. So training the emulator is, is straightforward. We do it on hundreds of points. And then the emulator is essentially free to evaluate relative to the evaluation cost of the climate model. So the emulator, we can sample millions of times with standard methods. And so what comes out in the end is an approximate Bayesian posterior distribution of theta at a cost that is the cost of the expensive step here, the calibration step, so which has the order of 1,000 model evaluations rather than millions hundreds of thousands. So you get something like a factor thousand or so speed up over standard MCMC methods by using this calibrate emulate sample pipeline. And in our experience so far, you're not losing much accuracy and computing approximate Bayesian and posteriors. And in fact, for problems like the climate system, it's chaotic, it has internal variability. The emulation step gives you additional smoothing through Gaussian processes and what I'll show you next that actually helps um, makes this problem more stable, more robust. Um, let me just show you one quick example from an idealized climate model. This is very simple. It's um, a model that Paulo Gorman at MIT and, and I have worked with for a number of years, a while back. And the only thing you need to know here right now is that there's a temperature equation, a specific humidity equation, and they have very simple parameterizations for convection, which is just linear relaxation towards a reference state over some time scale tau. And the reference state has some relative humidity, RH, which are two tau and this RH are two adjustable parameter in the simple scheme. This is just a proof of concept. It is not at all a good climate model or realistic, but it illustrates the concepts. So we have our two-dimensional parameter space. Um, this is a perfect model setting. We know what the true parameters are with which we generate the data from which we want to learn these, these uh, parameters. The true parameters are 0.7, 70% for relative humidity and two hours for this time scale. And we designed an object objective function that minimizes mismatches in the relative humidity as a function of space, in the mean precipitation rate as a function of space, and in a measure of extreme precipitation rates as a function of space. And we do ensemble common inversion for parameters in this convection scheme. So there are 100 uh, ensemble members in this ensemble common inversion. So there are 100 points on this plot here in this two dimensional space. This is the prior. This is how they start out with. And then you let the ensemble common inversion do its thing. And within five iterations or so, the ensemble collapses almost to a point that pleasingly is very close to the true parameter values here. So ensemble common inversion gives good calibration properties here, 
What it does not do is give good uncertainty quantification. The ensemble collapses. Um, the spread of the ensemble is not a useful measure of the uncertainty here. So in these 500 or so um, climate model elevations we had, so ensemble size 100, five iterations, we use these as training points for a Gaussian process emulator. And here are the statistics that are in our objective function, some relative humidity, a precipitation rate. And what is shown here is the probability of exceeding a threshold, a precipitation threshold, which in this case is picked to be the 90th percentile of precipitation. So it should be exceeded 10% of the time. And what the the blue line show you is, is what this climate model does, the simple climate model does with the bars indicating 95% um, confidence intervals and the orange shading is a Gaussian process emulator. And this is just to show, show that the Gaussian process emulator emulates the climate model statistics extremely well. There are some tricks to doing this well. You need to transform to bases where the Gaussian processes are uncorrelated and the like, but it, it can be done quite well. Um, the Gaussian process emulator could be replaced by a neural network and in fact might be desirable to do so because it scales better to higher dimensional spaces than Gaussian processes do. And then you sample the emulator with standard MCMC. Here is 500,000 iterations and out comes the blue shading, which is the Bayesian posterior. And you see the maximum of the posterior here is centered at two hours and 0 0.7, which was two parameter values. The common ensemble, this is just the last iteration of the common ensemble. It's not actually quite as close to the true value, although still close, but more importantly, the ensemble is um, quite collapsed. So the spread of the ensemble is a poor measure of the uncertainty here. The variance of the posterior is much larger than the ensemble variance. It's a well-known problem of this ensemble common inversion that, the, that, that it's not, not a useful uh, algorithm for uncertainty quantification, but for solving the problem of finding good training points to training an emulator, it's great and that scales well and then we can sample the emulator to get good uncertainty quantification. We know this uncertainty quantification is good by, in this model is simple enough, we can do brute force MCMC on the model itself and um, you just see that the variances or standard deviations for these two variables that we get from the posterior here and our goldish standard, if you wish, they're quite close to one another. So we are confident this is actually accurate uncertainty quantification. You can, you then have a posterior ensemble of parameters in this model. You can sample from that posterior ensemble and do climate predictions. So here's just one example. Now we change boundary conditions, make the climate warmer by increasing the, um, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And what's shown here is the probability of exceeding what was the 99.9th percentile of precipitation in the control climate. So in the control climate, the probability of exceeding 99.9th percentile would be 0.1%. Uh, and in the warmer climate, that percentile is exceeded, well, in higher latitudes, um, twice, almost three times as often. But more importantly than just the change in the mean is that now the shading here gives us confidence intervals obtained from sample of realizations we have drawn from the posterior. And you see things like in the tropics, the uncertainty and changes in the extremes is quite large in this model. And we know this to be true in climate models generally. And here now is, is a quantification of this uncertainty, all still subject to this constraint that this model is seem to be perfect. So this is only sampling the parametric uncertainty. We have worked and are working on, on uh, representing systematic model error, model form error. And that would be another interesting topic to talk about. I won't have time now. Um, the key for doing that, well, it turns out is to impose sparsity constraints. Um, in some ways, if you add a model for model error, the first thing you want to do is do no harm. You don't want to um, add a model for model error where there may not be a model error. So promoting sparsity and model form error quantification is extremely important. Um, so the, the, the last part is sort of the general algorithm. We want to use it for all forms of model quantification, calibration uncertainty quantification. I showed you some example for clouds. Uh, Raf, John Marshall and others at MIT are working on uh, similar ideas for ocean turbulence. 
there's a group working on the land biosphere where he's starting to use similar me similar methods to um, to calibrate the uh, the land model and so forth. So what we want, we started two years ago with this. What we want within five years is to have a model that learns automatically from observations and high resolution simulations. We want to achieve at least a factor two reduction in RMS errors of climate statistics that matter, for example, rainfall extremes. And what we also want is this information to be usable. What we're doing is basic science in some ways, but basic science with an eye towards the applications we all need, which is information for climate adaptation. So what we would like to have is that this becomes a platform that anchors some ecosystem of apps, downstream apps, for example, for flood risk modeling, where we are having some concrete collaborations already for infrastructure planning and the like. Um, if you want to reduce our approach here to a cartoon, I think this is this is what it is. And I think that's the part that I think generalizes to other fields of science and engineering. We have a model, we have data of various forms generated computationally, observational data, experimentally generated data and the like. In general, um, you get from model to data by designing experiment in the field of experimental design and you inform the model by learning from the data. And what is domain specific and specific to atmosphere, ocean, land, climate or material science, whatever you do, are the models and the data, but these edges of this graph, learning about a model and designing experiments, I think can often be automated. You, you hear a lot about automated chemistry labs, uh, automated design and material design and the like. And that's, that's I think where quantitative and qualitative progress can be made now. We can stake our process informed models, our domain specific data, but then automate this loop. This is in some ways the loop that science has gone through since the beginning of empiricism 400 years ago. Um, but now we can do a lot of it automatically and much faster than before. So progress here can come from going through this loop much faster and many more times than we have in the past. So for example, we can generate data experimentally or with, with spinning out high resolution simulations and climate model, we can generate perhaps 10 to four times more computational experiments than we have used in the past. And we, we can use many more observational degrees of freedom than before. And I think the progress in the climate sciences will come from doing this better and faster. And I think that part is um, true for other fields of science and engineering as well. So what, what we want is reducing and quantifying uncertainties. Um, the problem is urgent. It's really climate is changing rapidly. And for us, the race is to get ahead of the climate change so that we predict things before they happen. Um, what we're doing is we combine process informed models with data driven approaches. And this is based on climate statistics. It avoids a bunch of problems. For example, one thing is often stated that model resolution and resolution of observations don't match. By focusing on time aggregates, that problem goes away. We use physics based subgrid scale models. Um, in the physical parts of the system, they can capture turbulence and cloud regimes. And this um, is a good, good step forward in problems that have vexed climate models since the beginning of climate modeling for, for decades. And our models learn both from observations, eventually, we haven't done that yet, but that's coming in within the next year or so. And they're already learning from high resolution simulations that right now we generate offline. Eventually, you can just generate them on the fly as a climate model runs. They also give you um, a guard against overfitting because you can do it as the climate changes where you leave the realm of observed um, climate statistics to make sure you're not overfitting. This calibrate emulate sample approach, I think it likewise is usable across other fields of science and engineering. It's the core of our data simulation machine learning layer and it, it gives us up to about a factor thousand speed up relative to traditional Bayesian learning methods. And it's, it's a good way of combining process informed models, reductionist science with so the best we have learned from the data sciences. There's a lot that still remains to be done. We are still putting various component models together, making progress on these various subgrid scale models for atmosphere, ocean, working on land models. Um, we still have a lot ahead of us the next few years. Um, it's all made possible primarily by Eric and Wendy Schmidt, who are uh, funding most of this endeavors by recommendation of, of the Schmidt Futures Program. Mountain Philanthropies is a major funder. The National Science Foundation is, um, is pro providing support through a CSSI grant. We had some support from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation and Charles Trimble and Ronald McZean Lind, Lind provided support as well. So with that, I 
Thank you and happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. I'm sure there are a lot of applauses that we cannot hear, but now we'll open for a question. I'll start reading one that was submitted while you were speaking. It's probably somebody who has good links to Caltech. And the question is, would the recent work on Fourier neural operator for parametric partial differential equations by Professor Ann Kumar at Caltech uh, help in the climate model, in the calibration of common models? Yeah, so I mean, the essence of what I said is you, you go as far as you can, say with coarse graining in the end, you end up with some functions you want to estimate from data. And then there are many different ways you can learn about these functions from data. And um, it, free bases are, are nice for their approximation properties and, and they may be a good, good basis and approaches like what Anima and Andrew and others have been working on could be used there, yes. More questions? Otherwise, maybe while we wait for people to unmute themselves, I'll ask one myself. Uh, one interesting question that might come up is that there are there is a possibility of what people like to call tipping points or transitions from one climate state to a pretty different one. A good example for an oceanographer would be the collapse of the overturning circulation. In a situation like that, one wonders that you can calibrate as much as you want the model, but it's always going to be on states that you have observed and you're entering in a new state that you probably cannot easily simulate because you cannot run a large climate model at sufficient resolution to be credible. So how do you think what should address the problem of trying to extrapolate to states that yeah. you're not likely to have observed because you might not anticipate them? I think that's the strongest argument there is for using physics-based models as far as you can, right? So even, even though, if you have a physic, a physics based model or a process based model that you trust, right? I mean, say it's even celestial mechanics, you can predict all sorts of things you haven't observed, even after you have only fitted some, a few parameters to planetary ma masses and gravitational constants and the like, and you still get a good system for predicting things no one has seen. So same is true here, I think, as long as your physics are, are, right or it depends what you're learning from data right if what you're learning are are small scale processes that you know are, are, are fluctuations that happen in the present climate as much as in a changed climate and if that's what you need to close and it's that's all you need to close then you can learn the closure from the present climate and still predict things that are entirely different um i mean just one concrete example i've worked on right stratocumulus clouds maybe there is a tipping point that, that they break up as CO2 concentrations go up. If there is, then that comes because of interactions with radiative transfer um, of these clouds. And the, the results I showed you, we calibrate those clouds, those schemes with statistics of the present day climate, but they can produce these transitions without any problem because the physics is there. Thank I think you. it's a strong argument against entirely data-driven approaches, right? If if you don't use the physical constraints, then there's no hope that you'll predict something that isn't in your sample in any with any reasonable accuracy. But as long as you know, the rest of your physics, so, and I always say physics because I come from physics, but the same is true for any biolog biological model, any the process informed part is right, you should be able to predict things out of sample, tipping points and the like. Please feel free to ask questions or put them on the chat and I'll read them if you prefer that way. I think the real issue here is if, if you're a structural model error, right? So the, then that's where it gets really hard, right? And that's, I think, why we need to work hard on trying to quantify this as best as we can. But then there there is a possibility, say, if you're if your tipping point depends on, on structural model errors that you can't be certain about, well, then you can't be certain about your predictions of tipping points. So, so yeah. I, I question a little bit on the, 
on the policy side, if I may, um, other than scientific interest, um, and of course the techniques used could be applicable to many other uh, disciplines, I'm wondering uh, who would be a customer for a climate model like that? Would be governments for making policy? Um, uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, the, so the policy part, there are some. I mean, you, you can argue that with better climate information, you can have more informed policies, but you can also say, well, we have enough climate information to come up with better policies than we have. So maybe the marginal improvement of policy with better climate information may not be huge. But I think the real customer, if you wish, is economic activity throughout all economic spheres it will start to be affected by climate change. Just a few examples. Um, California pension plans are now required to be risk stratified. The portfolio is required to be risk stratified and risk assessed for climate. So this is $700 billion worth of investment where climate risks have to, have to be assessed. And well, this is one obvious application where good climate information will be economically valuable. Any kind of planning infrastructure usually lasts decades, 40, 50 years, you know, stormwater management, seawalls, um, energy infrastructure. So you make long range decisions in, in investment decisions there that you want to make in a way that is proactive and effective in a changed climate. And there you need good climate information. So I think my take is the information we provide is most useful for what you might call adaptation and probably more regional planning, municipal planning, um, economic activity generally than mitigation policies. Okay, good. There is an interesting question is that, have you seen this kind of approach in applications like large scale with wildfire modeling as well? Wildfire modeling is young. Um, you could use this approach for, I mean, it, it's part of what we want to do and we've had discussions about, we have a land model, it will give you information about how dry the soil is, what vegetation there might be in a changed climate. And you can use that as input for a more detailed wildfire model that then assesses wildfire risk in, in much the same way as we can talk about cloud changes. Okay. I think maybe in the interest of time at this point, we should come to a close, but I'm sure people have a real, oh, well, maybe there is one more. <laughs> For scientific machine learning in wildfire modeling, I know that there are some students doing a project. Maybe this is a comment in differential equation flux.jn. So ACRI people yeah. are trying to, and probably yeah. connected to the CLIMA project. That would be fun. Yeah, yeah, there are some good wildfire models. For example, in Irvine, it's a very active wildfire modeling effort. Uh, but Otherwise, uh, I want to just to conclude by saying that Tapio, I'm sure that if you have interesting question or you want to follow up, uh, his, uh, uh, can be reached uh, at Caltech at his email, uh, given the constraints of the crazy world we live in and that everybody is overcommitted. But, um, and uh, more in general, a lot of the work that Tapio presented is part of this CLIMA project. And there is a strong presence at MIT, the Julia group is having involved, a group of us in IPS is having involved. And we are always happy to talk with anybody that might be interested in contributing ideas or participating. So take full advantage. We are glad always to interact and learn new approaches. But thank you very much otherwise. And again, thank you Tapio for a great and illuminating talk. Bye-bye. Nice to see you. Thanks.